Welcome to our 2016 International Conference of Educational Technology. Um, we would like to start the um, conference by the opening address by Jae Sam Chung, the president of Korea Society of Educational Technology. Uh, I, I want you to um, welcome him with big applause. Uh, we cordially welcome all of you to 2016 ICET Seoul International Conference. Hoping you join us at the Korea University Incheon Memory Hall. This international conference is especially organized in the collaboration of AECT and KSET with the support of Korea Research Fund, uh, CARIS, KAIS and KRIBET, and Cheongdam, UBN, CREDU, UPOLARIS, TECHBILL, and so on, as an effort to continue discussion on recent research and practice regarding educational technology with the national and international expert from the United States, Canada, England, South Africa, Thailand, Singapore, Japan, and Korea. The main theme of this conference is rethinking educational technology in the smart learning environment. The topics will be touched and addressed to you in various formats, uh, keynote speeches, concurrent sessions in three tracks, uh, invited sessions and the panel discussion and post sessions. We hope that all international and national presenters, discursant and, and engaged participant result in uh, even stronger network uh, to share in, invaluable expertise and experience for the purpose of facilitating learning and improving performance in this conference. It is beyond my description to appreciate to the gigantic effort of Professor Hyunjin Kim at the Korea University, Korea National University of Education, and the Professor Inu Park uh, at Korea University for preparing uh, this dandy program and providing the whole building and the logistics and the human resources. Uh, is here Dr. Kim and Dr. Park? Yes. Give them uh, big hands. At this moment, let me introduce the very important people in this hall. Uh, Dr. Seok Su Han, president of CARIS, right there. Dr. Yamanichi from Japan, president of JSET. Dr. Percy Kitt from United States, president of AECT. And Dr. Branch from United States, the keynote speaker tomorrow. And Dr. Kronje from South Africa, uh, keynote speaker today. Uh, how about the conference interns and volunteers here? Uh, they are doing uh, lots of things. So, uh, and we also have a financial supporters uh, in this conference. Uh, finally, even we have a small audience right now here. Uh, finally, all of you, please stand up. Please stand up and uh, uh, shake hands with your neighbor. And say, how are you? And good morning, great to see you. Okay, here we go. See it. Thank you for your cooperation.
for being a part of this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jung. Um, I would like to um, introduce Sok Su Han from the, um, he is the president of CARIS, Korea Education and Research Information Service. He's going to give us a congratulatory address. I would like uh, to welcome him with big applause. Good morning, everybody. Uh, before starting my address, uh, I, I bring my address written in Korea. My step just <laughs> uh, give the address written in Korea. Uh, I learned English a long time ago, so I almost forgot. So <laughs> I'm not good at English. Uh, but there are many Koreans, so uh, I speak my address in, in, in Korea. 안녕하십니까. 한국 교육학술 정보원 원장 한석수입니다. 1985년 창립 이래 우리나라 교육 발전에 크게 기여해온 한국교육공학회의 응원 발전을 기원하며 2016년 교육공학 국제학술대회 개최를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 본 학술대회가 성황리에 개최될 수 있도록 만반의 준비를 해주신 정재삼 회장님을 비롯한 학회 관계자 여러분, 참석해주신 회원 여러분들께 감사와 축하의 말씀을 드립니다. 바쁘신 중에도 멀리 오셔서 행사를 더욱 의미 있게 해주신 미국 교육공학회 K. 퍼시치트 회장님, 일본 교육공학회 준이치 야마니시 회장님, 그리고 기조 강연을 해주시는 남아공 케이프 펜인슐라 공과대학 요하네스 크로네 교수님, 미국 로버트 브랜치 교수님께도 감사를 드립니다. 이번 방문으로 국가 간 교육공학 분야 학술 연구 협력이 더욱 활성화되기를 기대합니다. 오늘 전통 있는 한국 교육공학회와 공동으로 국제학술 대회를 개최하게 된 점, 저희 캐리스로서도 매우 영예롭고 기쁘게 생각합니다. 한국교육공학회 회원 여러분의 관심과 성원에 힘입어 우리 캐리스는 빠르고 안전한 수준 높은 교육학술 정보를 제공할 수 있는 공공기관으로 자리매김할 수 있게 되었다고 저는 생각합니다. 이 점, 이 자리를 빌어 감사하다는 말씀 드립니다. 지난 3월 프로기사 이세돌 구단과 알파고의 바둑 대결로 인공지능에 대한 관심이 어느 때보다 높습니다. 그동안 정보통신기술 강국으로 입지를 굳혀왔던 우리도 새로운 사회적 패러다임에 맞추어 시대를 잘 준비해야 할 때라고 생각합니다. 교육 현장도 결코 예외가 될 수는 없습니다. 저는 이번 알파고 쇼크가 1957년 스프트니크 쇼크 이상으로 우리 교육 현장에서는 받아들여야 한다고 생각합니다. 미국이 진보주의 교육관을 탈피하고 본질주의로 전환했으며 나사를 설립하고 새로운 비전을 제시해서 아폴로 계획을 성공시켜서 인류를 달에 착륙시킨 것처럼 우선 우리나라 교육에 있어서 패러다임 시프트가 필요하다고 생각합니다. 캐리스는 이러한 추세에 맞추어 정부에서 추진하고 있는 소프트웨어 교육을 내실 있고 효과적으로 추진하고 있습니다. 이미 작년에는 소프트웨어와 함께하는 창의적 여행이라는 제목으로 교육용 교재와 교사용 지도서를 발간한 적도 있습니다. 그리고 캐리스에서는 매월 1회 미래교육 포럼을 하고 있습니다. 지난달에는 학교 교육에서의 교육용 로봇의 활용 방안을 다뤘고 오는 4월 27일 포럼에서는 제4차, 산업평, 제4차 산업혁명과 교육이라는 주제를 다룰 예정입니다. 여러분들의 아낌없는 성원과 참여, 협력을 부탁드립니다. 교육 시스템에 창조적 파괴가 요구되는 이 시기에 교육공학이 나아가야 할 방향을 재조명하기 위한 국제학술대회가 개최됨을 매우 뜻깊게 생각하며 본 학술대회에서 많은 발전적인 논의가 이루어지기를 기대합니다. 다시 한번 2016년 한국교육공학회 국제학술대회 개최를 축하드리며 올조록 한국교육공학회가 지능정보 사이의 인재 양성을 위한 골든키를 찾는 나침판의 역할을 해주시기를 기원하며 바랍니다. 감사합니다.
Thank you so much, Dr. Han. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Junich Yamanish, the president of Japanese Society for Educational Technology. Um, I want you to uh, welcome him with big applause. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Japan Society for Educational Technology, I would like to be allowed to give a brief address. First of all, I express my sincere gratitude to the Professor Joseph Chang, the President of Korean Society for Educational Technology, and other colleagues who have made various preparations for the International Conference for Educational Technology today and who have received me warmly. By the way, the 21st century is said to be the age of knowledge-based society, where new knowledge, information, and technology will dramatically grow in importance as the basis of activities in all fields of society. In a knowledge-based society where competition and technological innovation constantly take place, People are required to have the ability to create new sense and value based on their broad knowledge and flexible thinking. Furthermore, the globalization of social structures accelerates international competition for new ideas and knowledge, as well as for qualified human resources, and also increases the necessity to seek coexistence and international cooperation among different cultures and civilization. Placing importance on these points, they are studying and developing for new courses of study in Japan. In order to cultivate the ability to think, to make decisions, and to express themselves, which is one of the weaknesses of Japanese children. Oh, sorry. Furthermore, the globalization of social structures accelerates international competition. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, placing uh, importance on this point, Japanese government developing the few new courses of study. In order to cultivate the ability to think, to make decisions, and express themselves, which is one of the weaknesses of Japanese children, it is necessary to have them acquire basic and fundamental knowledge and skills in each subject, and at the same time to provide them with more opportunities for language activities to utilize their acquired knowledge and skills through such activities as observations and experiments, the preparations of reports and dissertations. Furthermore, to cultivate information literacy is to cultivate people's ability to independently collect, judge, process, arrange, cre create, express necessary information, and to transmit and convey it. This may also help children steadily build basic and fundamental knowledge and skills and will be the basis of the language activities that utilize their acquired knowledge and skills, thereby contributing to their strength to lead a life. The OECD maintains that key competencies consist of three categories. Competencies to use social culture and technological tools interactively. Competency to form relationship and interact in various groups. And competency to act autonomously. Competency to use social culture and technological tools interactively includes the ability to use, utilize knowledge and information, and the ability to utilize technology. In such a background, Japanese Ministry of Education has a policy to set up the learning environment with one-to-one -one computing until 2020 and professional graduate schools for teacher education for the purpose of the bringing up a teacher with high practical teaching skills is set up in almost teacher training college in national university in this year. 
Furthermore, in not only the higher education, but also the place of the primary and secondary education, active learning is demanded. In such a situation, the field that education technology studies spread out more and more, wide and wide. There are four key words such as design, development, practice, and assessment in the educational technology research. To demonstrate the way of the desirable education for the children living in the 21st century, it is right demanded. All countries are the same situation, I guess. Our Japan Society for Education Technology had academic agreement with AECT last year to collaborate and share the result. And JSET has contributed a continued friendly academic uh, interchanging with KSET for a long time, and much human networks have been made. I hope that sharing of the research result and new collaborative promotion become popular more and more and strengthen friendship relation through ICET 2016. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a great um, congratulatory address. Okay, next turn will be the, the welcoming address. Um, K, Dr. K. Uh, Perskit, the president of AECT, will give us the welcoming address. Would you um, welcome her with big applause? Annyeong <laughs> haseyo. Dr. Branch and I are honored to join you for this 31st conference of the Korean Society for Educational Technology. We come to you representing the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. The mission of AECT is to provide international leadership by promoting scholarship and best practices in the creation, use, and management of technologies for effective teaching and learning in a wide range of settings. We have many goals with our, organ our international organization. Not the least of them is to work within our disciplines to define those disciplines, extend those disciplines, and provide professional activities associated with those disciplines. To serve and represent the professionals that are part of our organization, to advance scholarship and the practice practices associated with our field of educational technology, and to promote practices and policies that ensure humane and ethical practice in the use of technologies. A brief history for AECT notes that we were founded in 1923 by the National Education Association as a particular division of audiovisual instruction, then called DAVI, and it had a strong media focus at that point in time. After World War II, we developed as an independent association focused on audiovisual instruction and the systematic design of instruction. So we were evolving as a professional organization as our field was evolving. We adopted the permanent name AECT in 1970, and we moved our headquarters to Bloomington, Indiana in the United States in 1999. AECT is proud to offer a number of sample publications uh, relative to our organization that are uh, free and open access to the members of AECT. We offer two flagship journals, uh, Educational Technology Research and Development, more commonly known as ETR&D, and Tech Trends. Both of these publications are digitally available on the AECT website to our members. We also uh, 
offer a number of books that are published by the organization, edited and or authored by our members, and these and this is just a small sampling of those that are also available on our website uh, to members of the organization. The Handbook of Research on Educational Communications and Technology, a, an encyclopedic compendium of four, the four versions exist, and uh, a fifth volume is, in is not yet in production, but uh, calls for those papers are going out as we speak for the fifth handbook. Survey of Instructional Design Models, uh, a handbook of uh, ID models that is often used by beginning students in the area of instructional design. The Design of Learning Experience, another recent publication. And the Next Generation of Distance Ed, another recent publication. These are but a few of the samples available as free and open access to our members. AECT offers a number of divisions for your interest in particular uh, sectors of the, our field of work. Uh, cultural learning and technology, design and development, distance learning, emerging learning technologies, our international division, organizational training and performance, research and theory, school media and technology, teacher education, and we have, in uh, about a decade ago, added a new group to our organization that is the Graduate Student Assembly, specifically organized to include uh, access to all of our divisions, but give special focus to the graduate students in our field. AECT membership now currently exceeds 2,500 active members worldwide. We offer an international fall conference, and the upcoming one is October 17 through 20 in Las Vegas, Nevada. For those of you who are interested in seeing a unique part of American culture, come to Las Vegas. We have annual summer meetings with, uh, that alternate the focus on the research or on professional and leadership development. This summer, our meeting is July 18 through 19 in Bloomington, Indiana. Every other year, or in even numbered years, we offer a, an AECT International Research Symposium in the United States. Those meetings always happen in the summer, and this year, that's July 20 through 21 in Bloomington, Indiana. We are proud to say that we have a thriving international affiliate set of partnerships and that we continue to work hard to expand those partnerships and to help our international affiliates partner with other international affiliates. Here you see a list of our current international partners and uh, we are working with others uh, to develop further affiliate agreements right now, Turkey, Thailand, and others. We are particularly pleased with our partnership with KSET. It is one of the longest standing international partnerships that we have in the organization. And we are very pleased at our recent addition of the Japan Society for Educational Technology as a new international affiliate. Some of the current activities that uh, AECT is working on, we have a couple of new online journals that are now in production and offering uh, publishing and scholarly opportunities to our members. We have a set of standards for educational technologists and school library media specialists, and we offer a certificate program review for those programs to interested members. We work hard at our international outreach and again are very pleased to have had the opportunity to come and join you here in Seoul, Korea. We offer multiple webinars and Second Life activities. Those webinars are free to our members uh, and they are offered internationally on a regular basis on a multitude of topics. We offer 
an AECT instructional design competition for graduate students in uh, the six to eight month period prior to our annual conference each year. This is a competition that uh, graduate students take very seriously as they partner with faculty in their doctoral programs. We offer a series of, uh, through Springer Publications of AECT books and briefs. Our members are invited to submit proposals for those publications. They are sometimes practice focused and sometimes theory focused and sometimes research focused. We uh, will partner, just as we have partnered with KSET uh, to share this conference, the International Conference on Educational Technology, we are partnering with our colleagues in Bali, Indonesia to offer the Educational Technology World Conference to be held July 31st through August 3rd this summer in Bali, Indonesia. Uh, we have a major reference work that is a call for proposals that's been out for about a year. This will be a significant ongoing major work of references to the scholarship theory, history, and research of the field of educational technology that will be available digitally and updated at the author's desire. So as opposed to a static publication that never gets revised, this intent is to put these uh, works out there, these scholarly works available, and allow the authors to update them as they choose. And finally, we have a brand new journal that's about to hit the books under uh, AECT's authority, and that is the Journal of Formative Learning in Design. Formative Design and Learning, I'm sorry. A uh, brief uh, selection of the member benefits. Again, you have uh, open access to ETR&D, instructional science, technology, instruction, cognition, and learning. We call that the tickle journal and tech trends. Uh, there's also free online access to members for all four editions of the Handbook of Research on Educational Communications and Technology and many other publications. Free membership to as many divisions as you would like to join and free access to all listservs, webinars, and we continue to look for new ways to expand our member benefits and bring uh, the best kinds of resources to our scholars and our emerging professionals that we can. So I'll close my welcome to the and the opening of this conference with a thank you to KSET President uh, Dr. J. Sam Chung from Iwa Women's University. I'll recognize uh, his vice presidents as well, Dr. Park and Dr. Choi in the audience. Uh, JSET President. Yamanishi, who is with us, uh, the Kiris president, Dr. Han, who is with us, uh, our hosts from Kankuk University and Korea University, Dr. Lim and Dr. Kim, and all of the other folks who have been busy over many months and invested significant time and effort. The other planners, the chairs, the discussants, attendees, and most of all, those of you who will present at this conference. Uh, I will close with my best effort at Kamsahamnita. Thank you so much, Dr. K. Perskit, for sharing uh, great and useful information of AECT. Uh, next is the keynote speech. Um, keynote speech, Johannes Kronje will give us the uh, keynote speech. Uh, he, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit about him. Johannes Kronje is the Dean of the Faculty of Informatics and Design at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, South Africa. And he has been exploring the regionomic reason organization of content and learning 3.0. This summer, Kronje completed the, the hour of code and has reflected on our behavior as learners in 21st century learning. His observations are gamifying, motivation, highly structured, archive, sharing results, and so on. He holds two master's degrees in Africans in computer-based education and on uh, DRIT 
in Africans in 1989. Kronje also has been a visiting professor at universities in Norway, Finland, Sudan, and Ethiopia, and was instrumental in establishing the International Design Development and Research Conference held annually with alternating years in Cape Town. Uh, he's going to give us the the keynote speech about learning 3.0. What must we teach our learners when they are already producers of knowledge? I hope uh, we can welcome him with big applause. Actually, he flew over here um, more than 20 hours. <laughs> so he must be very, very tired. Thank you very much, Program Director. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for having me here. When I was small, we used to have a, a toy that was a big ball, and it had various shapes and holes. And you had to try and fit the correct shape into the correct hole. Did any of you have those toys when you were small? Yes, so you all had those toys. Now I understand why we were given those toys. It is so that when we are grown up and we work with computers, we will know which way around to fit a USB stick and an HDMI cable and not be confused with the various different ones. And uh, so that's, I, I'm not going to need this, by the way, because I'm going to be using, um, we're all going to do this together. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me start this talk by explaining to you what happened on my way here. As you heard, it took me about 20 hours to get here, but that's not the worst. It's going to take me 20 hours of staying in one airport just waiting for a connection on my way back. But that's still not what I wanted to tell you about. So when I first heard I had to come here, um, I was told, why don't you just buy your own plane ticket? So that was quite interesting. So I went to a website called Travel Start and I filled in the necessary things and it gave me a number of options and I selected and I inputted my credit card details and there were my tickets. And then I thought, now I probably need a visa. So I googled, do South Africans need a visa for South Korea? And I was told no visa required. And so that was it. And then on Sunday morning, my Samsung Galaxy S5 said to me, you can check in for your flight right now. Click here. So I pressed on it and I filled in some stuff and I decided that I prefer an aisle seat to a window seat on a long flight because that way you can get up and you can go and get yourself some more whiskey late at night and that sort of thing. So there are good reasons why you can select your seats, which I then did. And then on Monday morning, my Samsung Galaxy S5 again vibrated and said to me, you need to leave for the airport now, which I then did. And by that time, it also already had electronic boarding passes that I could just point at people. And then I came here, and it was quite a long wait, and I was interviewed by customs to find out why I came here with very little luggage, um, and for a very short time, I'm, I'm guessing that they thought that maybe I'm bringing foreign things into the country or so. Um, but at any rate, I came in, I met the young man who, who uh, accompanied me on the taxi, and then in the taxi, the taxi driver could hear English very well. He understood the English very well, but he wasn't very confident in speaking it. And so he took his Galaxy Note and he pressed on it and he spoke to it in Korean and the Galaxy Note said to me, one hour, and I knew how long the journey would take. But I didn't have to worry really because on his desktop, on his, in his car, on his dashboard, was a GPS. And the GPS said, arrival time, 19 hours 30, 
which was exactly an hour away. And when the car clock said 19 hours 30, we stopped outside the President Hotel. On the way, I had quite an interesting conversation about some other things with my driver. The driver said to me, he, he said to, the, to his galaxy, he said some words, and the galaxy said to me, are you hungry? And I said, yes, because I knew I was coming to the dinner. And he said more things to the tablet, and the tablet said to me, spicy Korean food. And I was happy. Why am I telling you all this? Why I am telling you all this is that I was able to travel completely seamlessly without a travel agent to a country that writes in little sticks that I cannot understand. I am illiterate in this country. I cannot speak to you. I cannot hear you. I cannot read what you write. And yet, here I am. And this is what worries me. Is that, what is there left to learn? I'm absolutely fluent in getting to Korea without having learned a single thing. But the exciting thing is that, why am I able to do that? And the reason that I was able to do that is that learning has moved away from being between my ears to being between my head and your head. That's where learning takes place now. It is no longer the individual who is learning. It is the whole system that is learning. I am only as clever as I am because this clever device of mine also speaks to this clever device of mine, which also speaks to the cloud, which also speaks to your devices. And that is what today is about. Today is about a little exploration, and we're going to do that together. And for this, I need to thank my friend Rob Branch in front here, because he was the one who challenged me to do a keynote at AECT last year, where I had to speak to all the great minds in education technology. I had to speak to the people who wrote my textbooks. And that was very scary for me. And so I thought, why don't I try a talk in which they will do the work instead of I do, did. And it went all right, so much so that I was asked to come and do something similar here. So we're all going to work together. So will you please take out your Galaxy S7s? because I know that you're a more advanced country than mine. You already have S7. We're still on S5. Um, will you take that out, and will you please Google for... Or don't even Google. You just go to me. I am now a .com. My name is johanneskronje.com. And if you go there, if you go to johanneskronje.com, you will see this. So there... There you can see what to type in, johanneskronier.com, and then you will see a link called ICET Soul, and that's where we are going to start working. So I'd like all of you to go there. And that's what it looks like, and in case you can't get to Johannes Kronier, that QR code will take you to that very same site. And if you don't know how to use a QR code, that googly code will also take you to this very same site. But that's where we're going to do our work. So can I have a show of hands? Who of you are there already? Only two or three. Right, those of you who are slow learners, please join up with friends so that at least there is a device between two or three people. You need to work together here, ladies and gentlemen. The question we're asking ourselves is that if we are already producers of knowledge, what is left for us to learn? And what is it that we need to teach our learners since they are this clued up with knowledge?
So I'm going to give you some background to that. And for that, I need you to click on the first link that says rate the extent to which you are experiencing rhizomatic characteristics around you. If you will click on that link and you will find a set of radio buttons. I'm feeling very constrained here. Does somebody have a radio mic so that I can walk around? Because it's a bit sort of sticky behind this. Anyway, we'll see. So let me tell you about the rhizome. This is a concept that was devised by Deloise and Guattari in, 19, in the 1990s. And what they were saying is that up to now, our thinking has been about trees. Knowledge is a tree. And then that tree breaks into two more, and that breaks into two more, and that breaks into two more. All of you have done mind maps of school and so on, yes? So who of you are familiar with the whole tree structure of knowledge and that you use that to analyze when you learn? Yes? Okay, good. I'm having at least two people who, who are with me here. That makes me happy when I get some feedback. Um, so if knowledge is structured, so Deloise and Guattari said, actually, do you know what? Knowledge is not structured as a tree because a tree is always hierarchical. And very often, knowledge is flat. It is structured completely flat. So because the teacher happens to be in a higher position in the hierarchy than the children, it doesn't mean that the teacher knows more than the children. The children may know all sorts of things that the teacher does not know, like where they have hidden the chalk for the blackboard, um, like what's happening on the ground right now. And so consequently, we can't see knowledge as being on top of each other. We must see knowledge as a flat structure. And he uses the example of the ginger plant, which is a rhizomatic plant. It is not a tree. It grows with rhizomes that for, for more and more. So it's a pattern. Another plant that does that is a mushroom. It has these little roots underground and then suddenly a mushroom pops up if the conditions are good, but if the conditions stop being good, the mushroom just goes away again. And they were saying maybe the world of knowledge works that way. That if it is needed, oh, you are such a star. Thank you so much. If it is needed, oh, this, is, this is absolute freedom, being able to see you and, and be around you and so on. All right. So, so Deloise and Guattari say, okay, so um, the rhizome is this ever-growing thing. And I'm going to take you through six elements of the rhizome. And then what I'd like you to do is to vote on the little radio buttons. You'll see we have, um, th those of you who work with a Samsung will know that you can get from radio buttons one to about five. Those of you who use that fruit platform, um, what you'll find is it only gives you three, so you may have to scroll or turn it on its side so that you can get to all five. I'm going to give these characteristics, and I'm going to tell you something fun, is that if we are supposed to remember things, our re minds really find it hard to remember more than four things. And there are six characteristics of the rhizome, so how are we going to remember six things if we can only remember four, and it's actually very easy, we'll remember three pairs. So the first pair we're going to look at is connectedness and heterogeneity. The second pair we'll look at is multiplicity and asignifying rupture. And the last pair we're going to look at is cartography and decalcomania. So that's how we're going to remember those six things. And as I take you through those characteristics, I'm going to ask you to vote for the extent to which you are seeing that around you and already living that. So the first one we'll look at is connectedness. Connectedness means that all knowledge is connected to all other knowledge. And it also means that all people are connected to all other people. So who of you are on LinkedIn? Okay, there you can see already. So the fact that you're on LinkedIn means you're already connected to me, at least by somebody who knows somebody. So what becomes more important in the world, when I was a tiny person, I was told, son, it's not what you know, it's whom you know. 
But in a rhizomatic world, that's not even important. What's even more important is who knows you. So how available are you making your connections? And how connected are you with other people? And how connected are your devices to other devices? And that is a good thing because it gets me to South Korea with no problems. But it can also be a bad thing because how do I know that every connection that I have is a good connection? And that's what we need to teach our children. How to establish whether a connection is a good connection or a bad connection. The next element we need to look at is heterogeneity. So now you voted from one to five, how connected are you? How connected is the learning that you're doing? The next one is heterogeneity, which means that things are different. If you have two things that are absolutely identical, they are still different because there's still the left-hand one and the right-hand one, the top one and the bottom one, the one that was made first and the one that was made second. If you ask children about two things, they'll always be able to tell you that one is a boy and one is a girl. You could ask a chil children about salt, pe salt and pepper, and they'll tell you, that one is the boy, that was a girl. You can show them a knife and fork, and they'll tell you, that one is the boy, that one is the girl. That's how children work. They understand that things are different. And... This is what makes us unique, is the fact that we are different. Education, up to now, has always been about things being the same. Education only works when we do batch processing. So we take a batch of grade first graders, we put a batch of knowledge into them, and they become a batch of second graders. Then we take a batch of knowledge into them, and they become a batch of third graders. And so they carry on all the way to university, where in their final year of university, we put identical gowns on them, we put identical hats on them, we put identical hoods on them, and we give them bachelor's degrees to show that we have batch processed them all the way. And here's the problem. How do we break that mold? How do we make education that celebrates the difference? That one walks into an audience like this and one sees people from different areas, people from different cultures coming together and bringing vibrant new bits of information. Because if we have the same of everything, it's called inbreeding. And that is a bad thing. So our culture of, of um, rhizomatic learning asks us, to make sure that we work with difference. And so the question again is in our own learning, how do we teach kids not just to be aware of difference, but to celebrate difference? That when you find something, you must always be able to look at the opposite, at the other side of it. So vote quickly. To what extent are you seeing heterogeneity being celebrated in your education in the world around you? The next one we'll look at is multiplicity. And that's the fun one for me because it means that there are more than one answer and there are more than one ways to get to an answer. So let me explain this to you because it's rather fun. My country works in the metric system, but we have quite a couple of people from the United States which does not work in the metric system except sometimes. I don't quite know how the United States works. They drive in miles, but they run in kilometers. They do 10 kilometer road runs, which I, I have no idea how many miles that is. So but they run in, they drive in miles, they run in kilometers. So these things become difficult. So there I was in South Africa and there was a, at a place that makes picture frames. And they needed to make a frame for an American customer. And the lady at, the, at the, the counter asked the other lady, what is the formula to, con to change from inches to centimeters? And I said, if you want to change from inches to centimeters, you go into Google and you type into Google, how, do I, how many inches are there, how many centimeters in so many inches? And so she typed into Google, how many centimeters in so many inches? And it gave the answer immediately. So 
why do we teach children those formulas if Google will just tell them that? We need to start finding out the real questions that we need to ask. So in mathematics, we already know that there are various ways of getting to an answer. And all of them may be correct, but some may be more correct under more circumstances. And that is the challenge that we need to, children, to teach children. Discrimination, the act of understanding when to use which of the multiple things that are available and to recognize multiplicity. So your vote again, please. To what extent are you seeing multiplicity in your lives? Um, I'm supposed to end at 11 and I'm doing well, so I will get to 11. We may even do some analog exercises if, if, we're, if we're lucky. Um, Rob, you'll be happy to know that I'm not packing this one as, as hard as I did in AECT. We might end up just doing this one exercise and not all the others. So the next one is called a signifying rupture. And that's how you make multiplicity through rupture. So when I was little and a toy of mine would break, my father would say, oh, you are lucky, now you have two. And that is completely not true when you, you have one toy in two pieces. It's not two toys. But if you have a ginger plant and you break it, then you can plant two of them and you will have two plants. This is the fun thing. If you have one amount of money and you give it and you give it to another person you have no more money that person has money if you have an idea and you give it to that person both of you have the idea that person gives the idea back to you you both have two ideas ideas are worth sharing that's why there are ted talks called ideas worth sharing so in a world of a signifying rupture, it means whenever you've broken something off, you can plant it. In my country, we have two, we have now have 11 official languages, but we use only one, which is called bad English. Um, but at school, we get taught at least three of them. And somehow or another, every teacher teaches us, this is a noun, this is a verb, this is an adjective. None of them even acknowledge the fact that we had been taught those same things in a previous class. At some stage in mathematics, you get taught vectors. Vectors, which is about distance and direction and stuff, which is very hard for me to understand. In mathematics, you get taught about vectors. About six months later, in the physics class, so help me, you get taught about vectors with no recognition of the fact that you might have done it in another class. And that's what I mean by the absence of a signifying rupture. Surely, now something I do with my students when I have to teach them how to write a PhD thesis, the way I do that is to start by making them do a simple proof to prove that a circle with a center bisected by a chord does so at right angles. And we draw two, uh, two equilateral tri triangles, we prove congruency of triangles, and therefore they're on a straight line. It's as easy as that. Why do I do that? Because I want my students to understand the logic, saying, if you are given this problem, with the following theoretical underpinnings, you will have the following findings which will lead to a conclusion on which you can base certain recommendations. And so whether it is a simple grade 10 mathematical proof or whether it is a thesis, it's the same thing. That's what a signifying rupture means, which means that we need to teach our learners transfer. This is something that we discovered um, you know, Rob, it's fun when we discover things again and again and again. Um, a member of staff of mine for her master's study discovered that if you want industrial design students to transfer knowledge that they learned in one project onto another project, you have to teach them that they must transfer the knowledge from the one project to the other. Transfer does not occur automatically. As we know from Benjamin Bloom, 1956, said that transfer does not occur automatically. 
Isn't this fun? And Don Clark, a little bit later, transfer does not occur automatically. And so help me if my student doesn't also discover this. So, in a world where we are producing knowledge and where our learners are producing knowledge all the time, what, we must, what must we teach them? We must teach them to transfer knowledge because that does not happen automatically. So that's the A signifying rupture. Will you vote quickly for yourselves? To what extent are you teaching your learners to transfer knowledge and to what extent are you yourself transferring knowledge already automatically? So the next pair that we're going to look at is cartography and decalcomania. Cartography means we draw maps. Everything that exists is a map. Once that little rhizome root starts spreading, it makes a map for itself. And every map is different. This was a fascinating thing to me. When I, was, when I got off at the airport um, at Inchun, to think about, I was an individual in Johannesburg who climbed onto a plane when I became part of a multiple on that plane to Qatar, when I became an individual again to go through customs and get onto another plane where I became a multiple again to get off here where I then stood in a queue with people who came from multiple other... Can you see how confusing that map becomes? My map is completely different from every other person's map. And here's where we need to teach differently when we teach mapping. Those of you who, like me, have discovered the joy of Tony Buzan's mind maps will know that we give that to children. We say, take this textbook and draw a mind map. And you can even get mind mapping software with which students can draw their own mind maps. But what do they do? They take the textbook and they take the main heading and they make that the main, the main connection of the map. And then they take the subheadings and they make them the subheadings of the map. That's not a map. That's a tracing. They have simply traced other people's maps. So what should we be doing? If we want to teach for transfer and use cartography as a process, what we do is we say to, your, to the learner, take yourself and put yourself in the middle of the map. And now take the information that I make available to you from textbooks, from the internet, from various other places, and draw your map. How does all this knowledge relate to you? Then you will have a different map for every learner. And do you see that you then no longer have to worry about plagiarism? Because you cannot plagiarize my map because you haven't lived it. So the challenge to you again, vote for me from one to five. To what extent are you being taught, are you experiencing the world as your own map and not that you're simply being expected to give somebody else's tracings? Now this is the fun thing. At master's level, and in the United States, you guys need to think about your doctoral programs and you need to think deeply about master's programs as well. Because we have, in my country, a very strong tradition of coursework at undergraduate level and then full dissertation at master's. So what have we been doing? We have been teaching students year after year after year to do little short projects. After Four years of doing little short projects, we say to them, now go away and do a one-year project. They've had no skill in that. If I understand your doctoral programs correctly, you spend three years teaching students to do little projects and then expect them to do a big project in one year. So you unteach and then expect them to learn. No wonder there's such a huge dropout rate in doctoral programs because you're teaching the wrong stuff, even at masters and doctoral level, we're teaching the wrong stuff. I would think that these people are enjoying what I have just said. <laughs> Should I be speaking to your professor as well? <laughs> if we're going to work in a world of cartography, we've got to let go. That is the bravest single thing for an educator to do, is to let go so that the learners can learn 
in spite of us. So that's the mapping. So I'd like you to vote from one to five, to what extent are you being allowed to draw your own maps? And I forgot to look behind me, so maybe my machine has switched off completely. No, it hasn't, it's still there. Okay, that's cool. It'll probably come on live. Late. Yeah, there we go. So the last one is decalcomania. And what I'd like you to do without closing your current browser is Google for decalcomania so that you can see the absolute joy of what I mean by decalcomania. Now, ladies and gentlemen, decals are very, very well known in the East. It's what you do with porcelain. You take a little flimsy thing and you stick it on and it has a picture and you bake it. And so if you want to make a tree, you have lots of little bits and you stick them all on and they become patterns, that's what decalcomania is. So I'll show you, I pre-googled for decalcomania. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. Can you recognize that it's all these endlessly repeating patterns? So those of you who did science at school, chemistry, you will remember decalcomania is most well shown in a copper sulfate or any other crystal for that matter. A copper sulfate crystal. Remember we used to have to make them at school. You ha had to go home and you had to make an oversaturated solution and take a little crystal and put it in and then it evaporates off and then I never made my solution strong enough so it would drop in the bottle and dissolve. But fortunately some of my clever friends had two so they gave me theirs and then I was still okay at school. But the thing, about the, <laughs> the thing about those crystals is that they're all identical. They're all copper sulfate crystals. And no two are the same. And this is the mind-boggling thing about decalcomania. All are identical and no two are the same. And that's what we need to know about our learners. They're all identical and no two are the same. Their brains are identical. They've all got human brains sitting in there and no two of those brains have been programmed identically. And so, again, to what extent are we able to make those connections, to, to teach our students that they make their own patterns? And I think the most important thing that needs to be recognized in the process of learning is that we actually need to teach our learners how to recognize those patterns. Because who are the people, if, if you look at, at um, the, the purpose of theory, why do we write our doctoral theses? Because at the end of that doctoral thesis, we will have a theory, which means we will be able to predict and you can only predict if you already know where the pattern is headed. And that, I think, is the most important skill that we need to, learn, to teach our learners, is how to read the signs, how to predict. If I look at the number of times that I see a student going the wrong direction, particularly at doctor, doctoral level, you say to the student, this... I can, I can never guarantee that you will pass. But if you continue with this, I can guarantee that you will fail. And then the student says, doesn't matter, professor, I still think that I know better than you. I'm still going to submit it. And then it goes to the external examiner and it comes back with strong, with major changes and resubmission. And then I say to the student, I told you so. And it's not because the student didn't listen. It's because the student ignored the prediction. My bright students are the ones who know exactly what the patterns are that are wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are doctoral students, hands up. Who of you are doctoral students? Good. What is the purpose of a, do of a, doctoral, stu of a doctoral study? To get the degree. That's it. Not to change the world, just to get the degree. So listen to the words of Johannes right now. Go home and finish it. That's it. When my wife did her own PhD, she found somebody, I can't remember who the woman was, whose line at the bottom, my wife then actually put that as her line at the bottom of her email signatures. And it said, it's only a fucking PhD. And so recognize the pattern. There are five chapters. 
let me let me explain something to you. There are five chapters, and you just do what every chapter requires because the examiner gets given a rubric that says, does every chapter do what it's supposed to do? And if he says yes to all, you graduate. It's as simple as that. Please, people, just learn the pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, having done that, um, let me look at my time here, and it takes me to exactly two minutes um, with which to end off the session. And so I'm going to just quickly ask you now to, to uh, press the vote button or the submit button so that we can have a look and see to what extent this rhizome thing is happening. And I'm going to um, open my Google Docs. By the way, I must tell you, I did this presentation or I was going to do this presentation in China. And when I walked into the hall to start my presentation, I realized that there is a thing called the Great Firewall of China. There is no Google Doc in China. And there I stood. <laughs> it was a fascinating exercise. <laughs> so if you would vote. So there we can see what's happening. We're getting more and more support for the connectedness and less and less support for the decalcomania. I'm never sure when I look at this. Rob, you'll remember when we did this a year ago at AECT, it was, they were almost all the same. But these ones are really losing ground at the moment. I don't know it's whether the concepts are becoming more and more difficult to understand by the end of it, or whether it's um, uh, questionnaire fatigue. You know, when you fill in a questionnaire, when you get to the last question, you just answer any old way, it doesn't matter. I'm not sure what the reason for this is. And unfortunately, of course, since I never got ethical clearance from you to, um, to collect this data, I can't actually investigate to find out why it's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, so, to quickly then recap what I said to you today. Firstly, I said you put things in pairs. If you have six things to remember, you just remember three pairs. And so the first pair that we looked at was, come on, help me, <laughs> connectedness and heterogeneity. The fact that things are connected and different, and it's because they're different that they can connect. And all knowledge is connected to all other knowledge, and we need to teach students to do the transfer from one to the other. The next one was multiplicity and a signifying rupture, which means we need to plant new knowledges and watch them grow. And the last two that we looked at was mapping cartography, which means each one draws his own map. And the reason for doing those mappings is that we can look at the decalcomania and how patterns endlessly repeat being different but, but recognizable and we need to teach the skill of pattern recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world of 3.0 where our learners are producers of knowledge, the thing that we need to teach them explicitly still is how to learn. That's it.